Good morning, Restore Community Church. It is my pleasure to, to say hello to you this Sunday. If you don't know, my name is Dustin Pruitt. I'm the location leader for our Winchmore Hill uh, location of the Restore family of churches. Uh, and I get to bring to you this, this paramount week, this third week for, maybe it's just because I'm speaking this week, I feel it's paramount, but this third week of our Relevant series. Um, and it's so important. I'm sitting here. I have this nervous excitement. I'm not nervous about what's going to be talked about, uh, where I feel like a lot of people would be nervous. I'm nervous that I just want to get the point across the right way because it's something I feel so strongly about. Uh, and I'm going, to, I'm going to read the title to you as it was presented to me, uh, just so there, there can't be many any misconstruing of my words. I, I might be looking down more than I normally do in a talk, but I just want to make sure that my heart is fully conveyed in what I feel like is the heart of Jesus fully conveyed in this talk because this is, it's so polarizing and I think that's, that's part of the issue. So this is loving the immoral, how Jesus approached the issue of broken boundaries and sexuality. There's that hot word, sexuality. You get talking about, oh my gosh, already I feel some of you maybe sat up straighter in your seat. You started cringing a little, like, or maybe you're just, you got your axes out. You're ready to grind. Yeah, we're going to talk about the homosexual community and how we. Slow down. Stop. Let's go into the word really quickly. Let's see what Jesus really feels and says about all this. So I'm going to read from you starting off in Luke chapter 4 verse 18. It's Jesus is quoting Isaiah here and he says, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind to set the oppressed free. And right here when it says good news to the poor, the, 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 the term meaning poor there is people of low social status or outsiders. And I feel like this kind of like sums up Jesus' ministry as a, a totality. The Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, a little bit of accident. Everything about Jesus was the outsider, the tax collector, the sick, the, the people that would be unclean. These are the people that Jesus focuses ministry on. And I feel like today, this society, the outsiders, when, when it comes to sexuality, the Christian church, the Christ-like, the little Jesus that we're supposed to be is polarized and is viewed as nothing less than, definitely more than, but nothing less than a wagging finger. How dare why can make a scowl? How, how? This is what people view us as when it comes to a whole swath of the world's population. It's this. And I can't help but think that has to break the very heart of Jesus. Because we look in this. We look in every story. So how, and we know it's true. We read the Bible. We know God's word. We know it's true. So how do we hold what we know to be true and what we feel, that some of us feel, some of Christians feel. How do we hold that but the love of Jesus together? Well, let's look. We're going to go in John uh, chapter 8, verses 1 through 11. I'm going to read all of it right now, and then we're going to go in bit by bit. It says, uh, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. At dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him. And he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery and the law of Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now, what do you say? I might be color commentating with, with the, the tone of voice, but now, what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis of accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to, him, said to them, let any one of you who is without sin 
be the first to throw a stone at her. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away, one at a time, the older ones first, and until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has, has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. And I think we can, we can almost take this whole issue and look at it through the lens of this one passage. Almost. I, 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 don't, I don't advise that on any aspect. The Bible is a totality here, but, but we're going to break this down. That the teachers of the law, these are the people that know the most. To, to become a Pharisee, to become a Sadducee, to become a teacher of the law, you have to apprentice from a young age. You have to have memorized the Pentateuch. Know it word for word. You are the authority. So these people that are highly respected, highly sought after for their wisdom and their knowledge, come in. They bring this woman, a woman, caught in adultery and challenge Jesus saying, in the law of Moses, I can't help but, I, I did a voice earlier, but oh, in the law of Moses, it says this. Ho, ho, ho. I, just, I feel like it's that that spirit is in them, just high and mighty. But in the law of Moses, it commanded us to stone such women. Now, what do you say, Jesus? I, I can't help but do that. I'm sorry. What do you say, Jesus? And I immediately look to Jesus' response. What does he do? Starting um, at, at the latter half of verse 6. Because at the beginning it says they're, they're using this question as a trap. They know what they're doing here. That's why I think that there's, I give them a villainous voice. They know what they're doing here. It says, but Jesus bent down and started writing on the ground with his finger. I, I think it's so important. Jesus responds, these people are coming in and they are zealous. They are, they've given their whole lives to this thing. Their, their apprenticeship, they could have done anything with their lives, but they became a teacher of the law, a Pharisee, a Sadducee. They come in. They're zealous, just like we can be zealous. And they made her stand before Jesus. An act of public shame. Jesus is in the temple here, the temple courts, teaching. And they make her stand before him, shaming her. They expose their prejudice this way. They, they quoted the law, this law of... Found in Leviticus chapter 20, verse 10, it says, If a man commits adultery with another man's wife, with the wife of a neighbor, both the adulterer and the adulteress are to be put to death. And, I, okay, I, I understand that. I, I hear it loud and clear, Jesus. I read it in your word. These people that know your word by heart bring only the woman. When the word they know by heart says the man and the woman, they only bring the woman. So a deeper thing is going on here. That they're not trying to follow the law anymore. They're trying to have their own brokenness be pushed out on the world. Their own prejudice. Their own thoughts. And not what God gave them in the Word. And I, once again, I'm thinking about us. Once again, I'm thinking about modern day Christians and the church. The church is a whole capital T, capital C, the church, the bride of Christ. And what do we do? But, but we'll, we'll get there in a second. Jesus, they're expecting something, but he, he blows their mind. He bends down and starts to write in the ground. His his posture is completely opposite from them from step one. They stand before the court. They bring this woman to stand up that we are the authority. We know better. We have righteousness. And Jesus bends down, kneels in the ground, starts riding in the dirt with his finger. A position of humility, a, a position of where you would think the condemned would be. 
but he intentionally takes the lowest place. It's his heart just signifying to call to lift up the broken. And I've got to go low to lift you up. So he went low. I think that's so important. Now, we, we don't know what he wrote. We don't know why he used a finger. And I'm sure many theologians out there could, could tell you what they think and, and, and go deeper than I ever could. But I want to think that in the dirt, he's almost rewriting the very fabric of humanity. Remember, they, there was expectations and he, he always defied them. And since man, in the book of Genesis, as we know, is sculpted from dirt and life was breathed into him by God, that Jesus in the dirt is writing what condemnation will be going forward or should be going forward, what judgment, what this is. He's rewriting it all. I, that's, that's what I like to think. That's a, my own headcanon there. What I feel like I know of the heart of Jesus. And his response was, let any of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Now, Jesus knows. He, this is God walking the earth here. He knows he's the only one. Nobody's done it before. Nobody's done it since. The only one. He's the only one without sin. So he's suddenly the trap has been sprung on them. He's refusing to judge her, to shame her, to condemn her, to point a finger at her. Those, even though she was caught in the act. He is challenging any posture that is not first based in humility and in ownership of our own brokenness. Our own. Uh, there's somebody in the Winchmore Hill congregation, uh, Vicki. This is an old saying. I'm not saying Vicki came up with it, but uh, I hear Vicki say it a lot because it, it rings true every time. That every time you point a finger, there's one at you and there's three at me. And that's kind of what Jesus is saying here. He says, at this those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left. Maybe, maybe it's the, the older ones, the ones that have more experience, maybe a little wiser. The light bulb clicked for them a little faster. They understood that much quicker, but eventually all of them got it. And I think it says something about them that these men that were so sure in their thinking, so sure in their posture, so sure in their righteousness, were open to correction. That they even had this whole plan. They found somebody in the act of adultery. And they brought her in this whole scheme. And in the middle of it, it crumbles beneath them. And they take the rebuke. They take the lesson when I feel, it, let's step back from biblical times back into present times now, I feel like anytime sexuality is brought up in the church, there's instant division. The enemy comes in, it instantly divides us. You're on one end or the other. And typically it's, you're on our side or you're on the enemy's side. And these feelings, and I, I've never seen more scowls than when LGBTQ people are brought up. The, the, the belief system is brought up, the, the this is brought up, the that is brought These things that they think are, I've never seen more scowls in the church. And I think we need to be open to correction. It, the, the Bible often paints the Pharisees and the Sadducees in Jesus' time as the villain. Uh, they almost have the horns and pitchforks walking around, almost but we can't lump them all together in one big group. Just because they share a name doesn't mean they're all the same. These Pharisees took the correction. They walked away. 
So back, back in our time, back in present day, how many of us as the church, as Christians, which meant little Christians, that's what they used to call us back in, in first century, second century, was little Christs. How do we think of the homosexual community? How do we think of the LGBTQ community? Do we think of them all as one the same? Do we think of them all as like having the same ideology that is anti-Christ, anti-establishment, anti... Do you think they, they had a big meeting and they voted on a constitution of this is what we're going to believe as a group of people? And so we, when we encounter somebody like that, or that feels that way, that feels same-sex attraction, do we instantly think they're part of that group so they believe everything of that group and they're, they're anti-God mentality? We suddenly grab this big paintbrush and they get whipped with it. So even if that person came to you and was saying, hey, I have these feelings, we whip them with a paintbrush. How dare you hate Christ like all the rest of you? I'm making broad generalizations here. Please, please forgive me. I'm, I'm speaking very broadly, but I've seen it happen too many times. When, when I look in the Bible and I see Jesus, I, have, I don't see Jesus doing that. Jesus looks to the woman. I, I, I want to go back actually and say, each person, we, we've somehow drawn a line in the sand and we think it's us and them, us and other. Now we can replace sexuality on the other side. We can replace it with uh, Islam, Hindu, different political ideology. This other me and other mentality is ancient and pervasive. But we need to remember that each one of us, us and everyone, are fearfully and wonderfully made are children of the living God, that he wants to be reconciled to each and every one of them, that none of them be condemned. That's the heart of Jesus. That's the heart of Jesus. It doesn't, the, the Pharisees, when they're coming up with this idea, could have easily gone out and caught a thief. Could have easily gone out and got a murderer from jail or, or caught somebody doing another crime, breaking another law from the law of Moses they quoted. They could have caught someone breaking another law of Moses, but they didn't. But for us in Christianity, we, we kind of do the same thing. We don't condemn alcoholics. We don't condemn adulterers. We don't condemn thieves. We don't condemn anything like we condemn the gay, like we condemn lesbians, like we condemn anybody with a sexual identity issue. We, we don't condemn them like we do the LGBTQ community. Why? We are all fearfully, wonderfully made. Jesus knew them in their mother's womb. He wants to be reconciled. The Bible says that therefore there is no more condemnation for those who believe. He wants them to believe no more. To go back, it says, he says to the woman, woman, this is after they all left, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? I love, it. God never asks a question he doesn't already know the answer to. I always think back to the Garden of Eden. God is looking around, Adam and Eve, a bit of the apple, they're hiding away because they know God's going to see their nakedness all of a sudden. And God shows up in the Garden of Eden and he says, Adam, Eve, where are you? Do we really believe the God of the universe didn't know Adam and Eve were hiding in the bushes over there? God knows the answer to the question before he asks it. And he says, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? And then he says, then neither do I condemn you. That is the heart of Jesus. 
I, I kind of want to stop there just for a second. Why do we get to condemn then? Why do we feel that we should and the finger comes out and the, the grit teeth and the, your lips disappear all of a sudden? It says in the Bible, Jesus came that the power of condemnation would be broken over our lives. And, and I might be paraphrasing a bit here. It says, and in order that God's mercy be shown, James chapter 2 verse 13 tells us that mercy triumphs over judgment. In all of human history, every moment of mercy was greater in every moment of self-righteous winning. People remember the moments where they did wrong and mercy was given to them more than judgment. I remember myself, I, uh, I, I was a punk kid. Can I say that? It, it, maybe you don't understand that phrase here in the UK. Uh, being a punk kid is you just acted up. You didn't do right. Uh, if there was a rule, you were going to break it. Uh, I was a punk kid. I, I did not do right. Um, and this is a small thing I'm going to I'm going to reference here. But I remember my mom loves uh, decorating the house for each season, like for Halloween, for Thanksgiving, with another U.S. thing, for Christmas, for Easter. She loves decorating the house. And each decoration is carefully placed back in storage so it can come out the next year. Well, punk kid, I broke something. Uh, I remember breaking a, a, one of her favorite candle holders for the Christmas season. And I knew I was in trouble. I was in trouble. Because she, she'd explained many times before, just like in the Bible, explaining many times before what is right and what is wrong. And yet I did wrong. I broke that candle holder when I shouldn't have been playing with it. And she extended mercy to me, a nine-year-old, when I deserved punishment. And I stand to you today, a 35-year-old, remembering that small act of mercy. And that's such a little thing. That's such a little thing. This, this part isn't even in my notes here. Um, uh, an image that I've seen online before that breaks my heart, I'm, I'm tearing up now thinking about it, is a, a man holding a sign. He went to a, a, a pride parade uh, and says, for anybody whose father didn't love them, I'm a dad. I'll love you, come get a hug. I, I, I think it was, that's the general message of the sign. That's not word for word. And it's the image of him holding the sign and, and somebody coming up, crying in his arms because they were condemned by their own family instead of loved. And I've felt the same way, like, love. Jesus, here in this story, is showing us his heart is to love first, always. It's not to condemn. Always. We see this in another story in the Bible. Uh, Jesus is waiting at a well. A woman comes to draw water from a well. And he says, hey, will you get me a drink? Um, she's like, oh, well, and he's like, I, the story goes on and on. And he's like, look, I know you've had four husbands. I know the guy you're currently sleeping with also isn't your husband. And he doesn't condemn her. He didn't wag the finger. He didn't throw a stone. He didn't throw wa the water back at her. He extended mercy. He extended grace. 
and withheld condemnation when he had every right to, the one person, God on this earth, Jesus, the one person who had the right to condemn, and he didn't. What right do we have? Jesus, his heart over and over again, this is all that it is. And I feel like too often we've just acted like the Pharisees. To quick to judge and to condemn. When Jesus, he's invited us to live like him. He wants us to be Christ-like. To be like him. So when it comes to issues, and specifically today, this issue of sexuality, what does Jesus do? What, going into the Word, take everything that I've said, all the, the, the interpretation, everything else I've said, what in the Scripture did Jesus do? And we need to break down the religious mindset and have that relationship mindset. That the Pharisees, they, their, their whole life was religion, was law, the law of Moses. Memorizing it word for word, step for step, beat for beat. And it wasn't a community, commune with God. It was contract. Item line A, if I do this. Item line B, if I do this. If I break item line B, I have to do item line subsection 2E. Jesus broke that. He, he fulfilled that. Let me, let, me, let me be scripturally accurate. Jesus fulfilled the law. So let us be like Jesus in that. In posture, in action, in word, in totality. That his first instinct was to lower himself, to lift them up. Because he loved. Time and time again, Jesus loves First, first, the greatest commandment and the second one, just like the greatest, is love. Loving the Lord God with everything about you and loving your neighbor just like you love yourself, as if it was yourself. And I don't think this is love. And I'm calling it out. There's no difference. You can't tell me, but Dustin, it's different with homosexuality. It's different with gender identity. It's different. That doesn't count. It, it's all the same. And Jesus loves every one of them. The Bible says that while we were still his enemy, he died for us. We were his enemy. He died for us. I, I feel like I'm, I'm hitting the, the nail on the head again and again and again. And I, I open this talk up saying I feel really passionate about it because I do. We've been called to go to the ends of the earth to share the gospel, but I feel like the modern day church has cut out except for them, except for this community. I don't think so. And I, that's not right. That's not in the Bible. That's not the heart of Jesus. And we're called to live like him. If you feel like this wasn't enough or you feel like I was too confusing or you feel like you need a little bit more, I actually just challenge you, even if you feel none of those things, Andy Stanley just talked 
about this at, and, and I'm not going to compare myself to Andy Stanley, a uh, world-renowned writer and leader of a church. Uh, I'm going to put the link of the talk he just gave about this very subject uh, in, in the, the comments below, the description below this video. Go watch it, please. I just watched it right before I'm giving this talk, and I'm, I'm humbled by it. And, and I'm almost frustrated that I'm not just showing you this talk, and I'm, I stepped out of frame, and there's just a TV right here playing the talk to have you listen to it. Cause I think it's so important. I, I've been a youth pastor uh, for about, I was a youth pastor about 16 years before I, I came here to Restore. There's no issue that pushes somebody away faster than the condemnation to the homosexual community. I'll, I've seen teenagers get up and leave when somebody has said a hateful comment about it. Never to step foot in a church again. The Bible talks about it's a good seed. The seed's not the issue. It's where it's placed. Does it get snatched up? Does it get choked out? Does it get burnt away? I'm poorly paraphrasing a parable here, but we got to be good sowers. And it can't be done with hate. It just, it can't. It, it, it doesn't go. It doesn't connect. It does, nothing in the kingdom of God is hate. It's, so, guys, so, so anyway, about Andy Stanley, please go watch it. Click the link below if you have time today. Click the link if you have time tomorrow and you got time this week. So please, you got to watch. You got to listen. You got to take this in. Because we're all God's children. Now, to, to quickly finish the story here, I might have forgot a point. God then tells the woman at the very end, go and leave your life of sin. Jesus takes care of it at the end. Jesus leads her into transformation. But he loved first. He humbled himself and he loved her first before all that happened. So let's leave it to Jesus. Jesus takes us from glory to glory, makes us a new creation. That when we're baptized, it says we put Christ on like clothing. We are renewed and transformed And our being transformed, I don't want to say that as we, we've achieved, we're good. You accepted Jesus in your heart, you're good. It, we're continuing to be transformed and molded to be more and more like Christ. So let us be more and more like Christ by loving first, humbling ourselves. And Jesus takes care of the transforming, takes care of the molding, the shaping, and going from there. Please, let's, let's bow our head on prayer. God, we thank you that you loved us first because we didn't deserve it. When we were in the depth of our sin, reveling your enemy in word and deed, you died for us to save us because you loved us. You loved us. You could have condemned, but you loved. So God, remind us of that mindset daily to love first. That everyone around me is a child of God, fearfully and wonderfully made. And that you love each and every one of us. There is no buts. There is no exceptions. You love each and every one of us. 
God, I thank you for that. If you didn't, you wouldn't have accepted me, this uh, 15-year-old drug dealer, into your church, and yet here I stand before, transformed. So God, I know you can do it with anybody. There are no exceptions. You love us all. Jesus, it is in your mighty name that we pray. We all say, Amen and Amen. I'm coming back to the heart of worship, and it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm so Much deep.